Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Collins, and I'm the Director General of the IIEA. Very pleased to welcome you all to this IIEA webinar this afternoon. We're particularly delighted to welcome and to be joined by Dr. Jessica Matthews, Distinguished Fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, who joins us from Virginia near Washington today and Dr Matthews will speak to us for about 20 minutes and then we'll go to the usual Q&A with you our audience and you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom which you should see on your screen and please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you and we will come to them once Dr Matthews has finished her presentation. A reminder that today's presentation and the Q&A are both on the record. And please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter, if you'd like to do so, using the handle at IIEA. So just by way of introduction, let me just say that Dr. Matthews is a distinguished uh, fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She served as Carnegie's president for 18 years and before her appointment in 1997, her career included posts in both the executive and the legislative branches of government, in management and research in the nonprofit arena, and in journalism and indeed in science policy. She was director of the Council of Foreign and Foreign Relations Washington Program and a senior fellow from 1994 to 1997. While there, she published her seminal 1997 foreign affairs article, Power Shift, uh, chosen by the editors as one of the most influential in the journal's 75 year history. Dr. Matthews has published widely in newspapers and in foreign policy and scientific journals and has co-authored and co-edited three books. She holds a PhD in molecular biology from the California Institute of Technology and graduated magna cum laude from Radcliffe College. Uh, Dr. Matthews, Jessica, welcome to the IAA. The floor is yours. Thank you, Michael, and it's a pleasure to be here. I apologize to all of you at the outset because uh, although I'm pretty close to Washington, it's quite a rural area and our internet connections are awful. And they may, in fact, um, uh, be unstable while we're talking, but we can keep our fingers crossed. Anyway, um, it is, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to, to be with you all. Um, since we're talking about American power after Afghanistan, I'd like to just briefly start there um, by saying that once the focus in the United States shifts from the last few weeks of the war to the 20 years of drift and shifting missions that preceded it, um, I think that the shock of losing the longest war in our nation's history may paradoxically open a window for an overdue reappraisal of American foreign policy. And, and that's what I'd like to, to talk with you about today. Um, before we turn to the future, let me just say briefly uh, that I think there are three um, important lessons from Afghanistan um, that I uh, think Americans might absorb. Um, the first is that, that among colonial and post-colonial interveners, um, the United States has a record of being particularly bad about ignoring the history and the culture and the values of countries in which it intervenes. Uh, this is generally not the result of not knowing what those are, um, but because we do have individuals who, who know them very well, but generally they are not in the room when high level, top level policy is being made. Um, routinely, history and culture are treated here as background or context, rather than as critical factors that will determine the outcome and success or failure as they unmistakably did in Afghanistan. Second, it's important to know that what happened in Afghanistan was not caused by the lack of good intelligence. Um, throughout history, the commonest form of intelligence failure is the failure of civilian and military leaders to listen to what they don't want to hear. And that happened here. Um, at the outset of his presidency, President Obama commissioned uh, an emergency, high-level, urgent 60-day study to shape U.S. strategy in the war. 
And in, in his memoir, he writes that the report, and this is his words, made one thing clear. Unless Pakistan stopped sheltering the Taliban, our efforts at long-term stability in Afghanistan were bound to fail. So US intelligence knew the connections between Pakistan and the Taliban, that knew that they were deep and long lasting, and that Pakistan was providing a safe haven for Taliban fighters and leadership. The conclusion was obvious. It should have been that the US must either somehow break that bond uh, or cut its losses in nation building in Afghanistan. Instead, policymakers noted the problem, uh, tried unsuccessfully to address it, and then went ahead anyway. Uh, the third lesson is that U.S. policymakers in particular cannot rely on our military to conclude that a mission is unachievable. The military's core value is can-do. Um, its spirit is can-do. Generals can identify difficulties in advance, and they, but once a mission is underway, they will insist that things are getting better or that they will get better with more money or more time or more troops or more weapons. They will not question the validity of the mission. And this has bedeviled us uh, for this whole era of, uh, of interventions. It means that a president who recognizes that the country has undertaken something that it cannot achieve has to, at some point, reject the advice of his generals, something that commentators and the press will kick him for. Um, President Biden did have um, rare moral courage in recognizing that and, and acting on. Um, and finally, and maybe this is the most important for our discussion today, um, Americans do have the habit of wildly exaggerating the consequences, the bad consequences of its failures. Um, in the last few months, there's been talk of the end of empire, a return to isolationism, and huge gains accruing to Russia and to China, which may instead be saddled with the continuing civil war in Afghanistan and with the impacts, <clears throat> excuse me, of growing opium production and Islamic extremism on their own uh, peoples. Similar talk with far greater reason uh, greeted the end of the war in Vietnam. And 15 years later, the US won the Cold War and dominated the world. So I urge you, and as well as Americans, to discount um, much of what you hear about um, these awful consequences. Um, so what might a reappraisal um, of American foreign policy entail? Um, the first point, I think, may be the most difficult. And that is the clear need uh, for fresh thinking about our strategies. In the 30 years since the end of the Cold War, there's been an extraordinary period of global change. Um, it, we saw in the 1990s an outburst of multilateral diplomacy. We saw the creation of the European Union, of the World Trade Organization, the transformation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty into a permanent agreement from a temporary one, and many other steps. Um, at one point uh, in the middle of that decade, there were more international peacekeeping missions underway than there had been in the 50 previous years combined. So this was a, this was a, a, a huge period of multilateral action. At the same time, globalization, rapid change in technology, um, growing economic interdependence um, made board, borders more porous and security harder to achieve and to maintain. Digital and nuclear technologies gave weak and failing states an unprecedented ability to threaten strong states. The attacks of 9-11 uh, brought the, the specter of terrorism, certainly to the US, um, the threat to the homeland um, for the first time since 1812. Um, far less of a change uh, for Europe and most of the rest of the world, but transformative for us. Um, China in this period grew its GDP by an almost inconceivable 40 fold, um, broke out of its posture as a passive recipient of rules and norms made in the West. Russia contending with the after effects of the sudden loss of empire became host to an aggrieved nationalism. 
Um, at the end of the Cold War, fewer than 2% of Russians saw the US as hostile. Today, uh, that figure is about 60%. And um, we saw the need for action to stem rapidly growing threats from a number of uh, transnational issues, climate change, cyber warfare, uh, pandemics, uh, as well as conventional terrorism. So um, this was a, a period of really unusual uh, change and also of three enormous American um, missteps. Uh, the US invasion of Iraq and the subsequent, the consequent destabilization of the Middle East, the global financial crisis hatched in the United States, and of course, the Afghan war. I think I would add to that list uh, Trump's America first populism, populist nationalism, which called into question longstanding alliances, embraced authoritarian rulers, denigrated allies, and withdrew the United States from an enormous range of international agreements and organizations, many of which it had founded. Um, and behind the headlines, I should note that there were many moves that made it impossible for organizations, such organizations to operate. For example, during the Trump administration, the United States vetoed every nominee to the World Trade Organization's um, appellate body, its, its body of judges, keeping the number below the required quorum so that, and thereby depriving all 164 WTO member countries of the means to resolve disputes. Thinking dispassionately, uh, one would expect that from a time of so much change and several huge mistakes, uh, that it would be natural to call for a rethinking of assumptions and an effort to find new strategies. But all there has been so far has been a circular domestic debate among those who believe the US should exercise global leadership, generally unilaterally, everywhere and on every issue, and those who favor a more restrained definition of interests and a more multilateral method of execution. And, and this debate has gone around and around and around, basically depending on who's in the White House without reaching any real conclusions. So uh, what might um, uh, a new kind of foreign policy look like? Um, and what might its um, what might reasonable um, hopes for change entail? Uh, the first, I think, um, that is probably likely is that we have seen the end of the era of interventions that began um, in Bosnia um, and has included. Uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, um, and others. I, I think um, it will be a while uh, before the US undertakes another such intervention. Um, secondly, um, I, I do think it is time and there is perhaps a window for a hard look at the notion of American exceptionalism that has underlay, underlaid our foreign policy, certainly for the last three decades. Uh, it's, um, it's no news to you um, that our domestic situation now is very parlous, really quite ugly. Um, domestically, we have high income inequality, flat or declining intergenerational mobility. That is whether children can be expected to lead a better life than their parents, which has always been the core of the American dream and which no longer holds. Uh, we have deeply polarized politics, racial division, a population that is given to embracing wild conspiracy theories a diminished sense of civic duty, and even a question mark beside the sine qua non of democracy, namely the peaceful transition of power through elections. 
um, that makes the power of our example, which President Biden is fond of mentioning, uh, dubious at best. It also means that um, thinking about policy, reaching any kind of agreement on change in a country that seems now to be divided right down the middle, um, or perhaps 60-40 at best, um, is, uh, is going to be very, very hard. Um, but the, uh, the facts are so hard to blink at um, that one can, in a, in a sort of paradoxical way, be hopeful. Uh, that Americans can reconsider. Um, our record of international leadership uh, that also underlays this concept of American exceptionalism is, is very questionable and open to rethinking as well. It, it is at least arguable that since the middle of the 1990s, when the US began to withhold its legally obligated dues, first to the United Nations and then to a number of other international agencies, its foreign policies have on balance weakened the world's capacity to but I'm thinking that a, a discussion about this is beginning um, and has already begun. Um, among the agreements that the United States has rejected since the end of the Cold War, um, it, it is an extraordinary list. Indeed, in, the, in 25 years, the United States Senate has only ratified one multilateral treaty. And treaty, which was a uh, hugely important uh, on torture, certainly aligned with our values. The Kyoto also um, rejected. Yeah, yeah, you're just, you're just freezing there. You're just freezing there intermittently. Uh, so please go ahead. Okay. Um, so I was just listing all the international treaties and agreements um, that the Senate has rejected in the period since the end of the Cold War. Um, and then the organizations that the U.S. has left, um, including during the, just the last uh, four years of the Trump presidency, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership on Trade, um, the INF Treaty on Intermediate Range Missiles, the UN Human Rights Council, UNESCO, um, and more, and of course, the Paris Accord on Climate, where I'm glad to say we are now back, and the Iran nuclear deal, where I am hopeful that... Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Uh, you're just, again, is breaking up every now and then. Maybe you just go to audio, Jessica, for the time being. Okay, um, let me... Okay. Go ahead. All right. Um, so uh, my point in listing all of these is, uh, is that I think very few people recognize the degree to which the United States has in the last uh, two to three decades withdrawn itself um, from so many of, uh, of the um, international agreements. And that in this case, its history and its culture has evolved so differently from the European Union, which has been involved which, in an unprecedented degree of sharing sovereignty while the US has been walking away from shared sovereignty. Um, I, I am hopeful that if um, we can begin a, a rethink of uh, foreign policy, um, that this is uh, this recognition will be on the table. 
Um, so to be more specific, um, let me um, talk about um, some of these changes that we might that might we might see um, more quickly. Um, linked to a rethinking um, of our self self portrayal of exceptionalism, would are two longstanding practices of um, which are linked to Americans' belief uh, in that exceptionalism, which should be, in my view, abandoned. Um, one is the belief that shunning other countries, uh, that is refusing to formally recognize it or to talk to its representatives, is a useful exercise of American leadership, a gift that is something the US can bestow. Uh, to the contrary, there is a pretty clear record from Cuba, from Iran, from Afghanistan and elsewhere that this American habit mostly hurts itself um, and has crippled diplomacy where it is most needed, draining the modicum of trust that is necessary for successful negotiations and requiring that the most difficult and important and delicate interactions be turned over to middlemen as the Iran negotiations currently are, uh, where every interaction has to go through European representatives um, meaning that so much less can possibly get done and no understanding builds uh, between where it needs to come between the United States and Iran. Um, a related practice is a heavy, I would call this almost a, a cousin of this um, practice of non-recognition, um, is a heavy over-reliance on sanctions, um, especially unilateral sanctions. Um, which is equally unhelpful and should be drastically cut back. I don't mean to say that sanctions are not a useful tool of foreign policy, only that we have gotten into the habit um, of overusing them. Now comes um, more difficult uh, reconsiderations or rethinking. Um, and that has to do with a reconsideration of the degree to which US foreign policy has come to rely almost entirely on military strength. In the last 25 years, there have been only a few months when the US military has not been actively engaged somewhere in the world. That has created a world that expects US interventions and that measures US seriousness by it and encourages friends and allies to underspend on their own defense. In these years, both Democratic and Republican leaders, members of Congress have lavished funding on the Pentagon, tolerating enormous waste in the interest of dollars spent in their own states and districts. At the same time, our foreign operations through the State Department and our embassies, other uh, non-defense operations have been chronically underfunded. As the defense, defense budget has swelled, the gap has become truly grotesque. Um, to give you um, a sense of that, President Trump's budgets, proposed budgets for fiscal 1919, uh, sorry, 2019 and 2020, proposed increases for the defense budget that were larger than the entire foreign operations budget and State Department budget. Um, at the same time proposing massive cuts uh, in, in the foreign operations budget. Congress rejected those proposals. What is extraordinary is that they should even have been made. Um, this disparity in funding translates into huge differences in operational strength. And it means that generally the Pentagon is put in charge of, of missions for which it really is not suited generally because it alone has the money and the resources that other agencies don't have uh, to undertake them. And it, it's including uh, humanitarian and governance duties um, for which it really is poorly suited. Um, so uh, whether the US can begin to address that um, and in our maybe in our discussion period, we could talk about uh, how 
there has been such enormous focus on the cost of President Biden's um, economic and social program, Build Back Better, uh, where there is no public discussion of the continuing growth in the defense budget, which is shortly going to approach $800 billion a year. Um, finally, uh, we need a thorough uh, reappraisal of Washington's policies on democracy promotion. Um, far too often, and particularly in the last 15 years, Washington has acted as though um, democracy is the default political system. Um, to the contrary, it is the most demanding of political systems uh, that requires a literate, relatively cohesive population and a bedrock of institutions that can take a century or more to build. Uh, laying such a foundation can require a commitment of many decades as the British made in India or the US and South Korea. But countries that would welcome a lengthy foreign occupation are extremely rare these days, um, if they exist at all. And domestic US support for such a commitment will only be sustained where its core strategic interest is unmistakably obvious to people. Um, major figures in the US have criticized the end of the war in Afghanistan for a disastrous lack of what they have called strategic patience. But I think that misses the point that the American public had grasped, which is that there was no strategic interest in the war as Washington was, uh, was prosecuting it. Um, finally, of course, it should not need to be said, but it does because the US keeps trying that democracy cannot be delivered by force. Um, so those, um, uh, well, let me, let me just add one, um, one last thought. Um, the belief that is evidently held by the Biden administration, uh, that democracy is under a generalized attack from authoritarianism also needs to be rethought. Because dividing the world along this line, democracies on one side, authoritarians on the other, greatly reduces the chance that the five major global problems, that is nonproliferation, climate change, global health, cybercrime, and financial stability, that any of these can be successfully tackled because there are simply too many authoritarian states whose active participation would be necessary. So um, I want to be clear in, in, in closing that the changes that I have advocated um, do not add up to a new foreign policy doctrine. Um, given the, the pace and the scope of recent global change and the depth of American political polarization, it's doubtful whether such an advance is currently possible. Um, moreover, some of the needed shifts are not within our own power to achieve because it will be some time before others see an American choice not to intervene in some situation uh, or to remove a troop presence or U.S. base as something other than disengagement or retreat. The shifts that I have um, just sketched would amount However, they would amount to a dramatic alteration in US practice since the end of the Cold War. And such an America would no longer see itself as, as a cop walking the global beat as neoconservatives used to argue for in the 1990s. Or as realists now call for shrinking its interests simply to threats from China and Russia. They would lead uh, to a policy that is somewhat rebalanced between military and non-military instruments, uh, far more restrained in the launching of military interventions, and wiser and more disciplined in their execution, uh, more cognizant of the need for and the potential of multilateral institutions and agreements to solve problems, 
less prone to unilateral and often self-defeating behavior and more sensible in its attitudes towards promoting democracy elsewhere. It they would mean in effect um, an end to the tatters of hegemony uh, to which the US has been clinging and which uh, a reconsideration of which is I believe overdue. So let me stop there and I hope we can, I hope I have provoked maybe an interesting discussion. Thank you.